Hello, everyone, and welcome to CSA's webinar series, CSA Cloud Bytes. Today's webinar is titled Augmenting Native Cloud Security Services to Achieve Enterprise Grade Security. Just a few housekeeping items before we do go ahead and get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, go ahead and enter them at the bottom of the screen in the Ask a Question tab. We'll reserve time towards the end of the webcast to address these questions. Additionally, the slides from this webinar are not going to be provided. However, you can access this recording anytime by using the same link to view the webinar again. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Thomas Martin, who's a former GE CIO and founder of Nephosec. He and his team work with companies to ensure and secure adopt and operations of cloud technology. As a prior CIO and technologist at the General Electric Company, he led the migration of over 9,000 workloads to public and private cloud infrastructure. I also have with me Christopher Hertz, who is the VP of Cloud Security Sales at Divi Cloud by Rapid7. Chris drives strategic partnerships and transactions to accelerate gro growth for Divi Cloud and its customers. His sales and marketing teams work at, with customers and partners to deliver amazing experiences, identify areas of collaboration, drive innovation, and unlock value. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. We're really excited to have our presenters with us today. And without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our presenters. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, again, my name is Christopher Hertz, and I'm joined with Thomas. Thomas, do you want to say hello? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thomas Martin here. Wonderful. Well, hey, so first, I just want to set the table with a few things, and then we're going to dive into the meat of it, I think. But one of the things that we want to set the table with is the idea of a security achievement gap that is accelerating exponentially, um, and the exposure that customers have to that gap is also growing and that is growing in three dimensions and specifically this is around cloud adoption so as you think about technology innovation uh, that is accelerating the number of cloud services is rapidly increasing the number the change within existing cloud services is constant and ever increasing and the amount of time we have to adopt those cloud services is shrinking um, so our horizon is getting shorter and shorter driven by business desires and needs to be agile and in addition to all that, the number of people using these cloud services, the number of people who control them are also rapidly increasing and constantly changing. And this creates three dimensions. And you layer on top of that, the, the third, another dimension or, or, or another layer of that third dimension, which is the unplanned disruption that's occurring right now via pandemic, as people listen to this, uh, and the change in how we, we work. And all those things have moved our model from sort of a two-dimensional model that we used to be able to command and control very carefully to a three-dimensional model that frankly has created this enormous risk uh, and, and gap. And where that gap is coming from is essentially here in, uh, in the fact the shared responsibility model. So organizations are responsible for cloud security. So just to, as a starting point, cloud itself is very secure. Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, Alibaba Cloud, these are secure platforms um, that are not breached. But what happens is the way we operate the cloud can be insecure or non-compliant. And that's a huge issue. And so what we've seen, um, and what Gartner's talked about, and this is some, some, some quotes from Gartner uh, from October of 2019, they see through 2025, 90% of organizations that fail to control the public cloud will in inappropriately share sensitive data. Through 2024, the majority of enterprises will continue to struggle with appropriately measuring cloud security risks. And through 2025, 99% of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault. And so the question is, um, you know, does that have an impact? And the answer is yes, right? It has an enormous impact. Uh, we, have a, uh, we published a 2020 cloud misconfiguration support, Divi Cloud did. And what we found is that cyber attacks are on the rise and they cause real damage. So uh, we, we identified 81 major breaches from 2018, 115, a 42% increase from 2019. And those breaches along with others that, that caused by cloud misconfigurations, uh, we estimated a $5 trillion worth of damages in 2018 and 2019 alone. So this is a real and, and pressing problem. Um, and, and Thomas, I wanna turn here to you for a second and say, why does this keep happening? I think one of the reasons is that customers are not, or companies are not always aware that there's a shared responsibility model. So that's first is, is that you need to operate with that. But most companies have gotten that now. Um, but what we've seen, and, and we did, Divi Cloud did a, a 2020 State of Enterprise Cloud and Container Adoption Security Report. We surveyed more than 2,000 uh, IT professionals in 2019, actually the same thing in 2018 as well, and, and we publish it every year. 
And in that, 42% of IT professionals surveyed did not know which frameworks their company used to maintain compliance with standards and regulations. Thomas, from your, from your view in the field, how does that jive and, and, and why does that represent a problem? No, I, absolutely. And I think you hit it right on the nail. And that is, is where our failure is occurring in our industry is, is really the fact that it's acknowledging that shared responsibility model and then making that both cultural as well as educational shift and understanding what good looks like. And I think uh, with this, it's, it's these frameworks that provide a great starting point as to what good looks like and what we should be looking at specific to those resources across the cloud to ensure that we're protecting the enterprise assets. And, yeah. and you're right, it's, 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 it's choosing that model, adopting it, and then measuring to it. Well, I think, I think you're, you're spot on. And, and that's the, the next thing we talk about as well is that you have this misalignment between developers and security relative to cloud. And part of that's because we've democratized access to cloud, right? So now developers and engineers can self-service access software-defined infrastructure in Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud Platform or Alibaba Cloud. But we haven't necessarily democratized security. Yeah. And we haven't delivered security at the right time and the right place and in the right way in meaning education, uh, trust but verify. Too often security is still trying to do command and control and mm -hmm. doing that at runtime versus engaging and shifting cloud security left into the CICD process, into DevOps and delivering uh, guidance and feedback and education uh, in a very tight cycle uh, it, during that DevOps process. And, and, um, and so I think, you know, and I've heard you say this before, but you know, because of that misalignment, you, uh, security is often a rock in the middle of a river. Water will flow around it. Um, and, and so talk to me about, do you see that happening still? Is this something that still continues to be a challenge? Absolutely. And I, I think it's, it's multifactorial. I, I think it's, there is still that desire for command and control versus the acknowledgement of that democratization. And I think where I've seen organizations be successful are the ones that acknowledge it, um, look to adopt those frameworks, internalize what that means to their organization, but then work in partnership right, with the development and application teams in a way that uh, reduces not only the friction, but enables the teams to work at the speed of cloud. And I, I know we're gonna talk a lot more about how that happens. Yeah, and, and here's the thing. I, I think the summary of the last five minutes or so is really this. One, cloud security is difficult. It, it is complex. It is, um, it is very much a function of culture and organizational dynamics. And, uh, and, and it is not gonna be something that's solved simply. But the cloud service providers themselves do offer native controls that help you secure this. And so we're gonna spend the next 15, 20 minutes talking about those controls and where you can use them to help solve this problem we've just described. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about how you can also augment those because you know, as, as you'll, you'll, you'll find us talking about, there are limitations to the native controls and how they can be deployed. And, and we'll work through what those limitations are and where you might start thinking about how do I augment the native controls and how do I do that? And so let me, let me dive in first and let's just talk briefly about the fact that native controls exist. And I'm gonna use Amazon Web Services, um, right? But, but functionally, let's, let's talk about what the value of native controls are or, or controls in general. You know, first is you wanna have the ability to have visibility. Right? Again, if you don't know what good looks like, if you don't know what, 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 what's there, then you, you certainly are going to be blind. The second is you need to be able to assess that risk. You need to be able to prioritize that risk. You need to be able to remediate that risk. And ideally, and we'll talk about this a bit later, you want to automate those processes. And last but not least, you want to be able to prove that all that's happening. Because again, if, if a regulator or an auditor or someone else comes in and says, how are you approaching this? Are you doing this consistently? Or even just... Um, uh, you know, one of your peers. You want to be able to show that that's happening. And so there are um, a lot of tools that are available to you. And some of these offer controls at levels that, or, or uh, insight at levels that you can't get from external controls. So let me give an example. Um, Amazon Web Services Guard Duty, which is their threat detection product, has access to the DNS logs to be able to drive some of their AI machine learning. They don't expose the DNS logs to any third party. 
So this, this product has a unique advantage relative to other threat detection products that you might find on the market because it is a native capability. And therefore, we really strongly encourage people to use the native tools for those reasons. There's other things like Inspector for vulnerability scanning or Macy for managed data security. These are all Amazon Web Services I'm picking on right now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and by the way, important to note, these are constantly changing. So if, you, if, if folks are using Amazon Web Services and they've looked at Macy in the past and said, oh man, that's very hard to use and it's very expensive. Well, Amazon heard you and about a month ago, they made significant changes both in terms of cost and capability. So again, going back to that world of like, and we'll, I'm getting ahead of myself, but why are these things complicated? In part because they're also constantly shifting. And so knowing when to use them and how is, is, is difficult. Um, but let's talk a little bit about um, how these align. Maybe, Thomas, can you talk a little bit about in the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework, often referred to as NIST CSF, right. there's four sort of core aspects of controls. Do you mind walking through what those are and then, and then why we often, you often recommend layering on automation on top of that? Sure, absolutely. Um, and, and so it's right there on the screen, but it is essential, right? It's, it's, it's audit, visibility, protection, detection, and, and then we'll talk about the automation side. But it's really having the visibility across all the resources, um, specifically, obviously, once deployed. But I think one of the more important things, and we've talked about this, Chris, too, is being able to try to shift as far left in that process in the life cycle, if you will. But to be able to do those checks, if you can, uh, as part of the CICD um, process to ensure that what's going to be deployed is actually um, going to meet compliance and security uh, guidelines. And I think that's so essential in today's, um, today's automation of CICD in the sense that if you have those problems actually in your code base, you're just going to deploy them over and over at the speed of cloud. And I think it's, it's having visibility, ensuring the right protections are in place, and then being able to detect it across the life cycle. Because once things are deployed, changes can occur. And there's, a, you know, there's a number of ways that organizations try to prevent that. But in case there is that change in the actual deployed resource, being able to detect it. From an automation perspective, though, knowing as close to near real time that, that a deviation has occurred, and being able to automate its remediation is really gives people the ability to uh, to resolve those issues and keep the enterprise secure. And I think you know the other the other thing you you mentioned in the past is you want to start looking at your the native controls and line them up against these buckets, right? Because fundamentally, it's it's sort of I mean, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, um, and, I, and I'm blanking on one right now. But but you know the idea being you don't want gaps, and so you want to be able to say where, you know, I have these, you know, how do I look at the native controls and start to line them up against audit, let's say, or mm -hmm. against visibility, against protection, against detection, against automation. And let me make sure that I've, I've identified at least one native control in each of my cloud service providers that's delivering that for me. And by the way, it may be a, a portfolio of those because some may be focused on, let's say, data, others might be focused on network, um, right? And, and so I think that's the other thing. And, and, uh, and then of course it's, how do I, you know, are there ways to automate some of those controls right natively um, as well to ensure that they're, they're being used consistently and persistently? Because I mean, one of the, one of the challenges I know, you know, when we'll talk about this is the goal here is that not, you're not using them on a one-time basis or in certain, you know, just sporadically that you have a strategic view of, I will use these and I will use them here. How do folks, you know, are there things that people can do in their environment to help make that alignment as they evaluate when and where to use uh, cloud native controls? What I've seen some, some of our clients do is, is certainly making some decisions around which services they enable and offer yeah. and try to create uh, guided patterns for application teams. And, and that provides them a much more focused ability when they're trying to use those cloud native tools as to which ones to deploy and align. Yep. Um, and, and by, by limit, you know, it, it is a limitation and that creates a bit of a rock in the stream as we've talked about before, but, but by you're at least, you're at least a little more comfortable around what coverage you have against those approved services. And I'm, I'm assuming also you, you've talked a lot with me in the past around governance, around tagging and around understanding application risk. I assume here that's another place, right? That, that if you're leveraging tagging and, and if you're aware of, of sort of the application itself, 
that allows you to start to prioritize risk and therefore choose where you would apply um, apply native controls. Absolutely, it's and you know, and it's one of the things that you and I like to talk a lot about, and that is is it's really blast radius, right? It's understand if you understand that configuration, whether it's through tagging or other aspects to the actual configuration of the application itself, then you can understand much more closely what services need to be protected, and as well as if impacted, how it might in fact impact the broader uh, the the broader uh, data set, if you will. Yeah, I, I've seen I've seen people use, and of course, get production versus development, right? You know, do you apply all these services to just only production versus development, test stage, sandboxing? And then I think beyond that, you, I've heard it's if we start to apply uh, tagging, right? There's sort of two ways we've seen customers do it. Some is they they said I'm going to tag everything that is tagged, or in uh, Google, let me labeling, right? So different terminology depending on the cloud service provider, but but applying a taxonomy to the cloud service. Not every cloud service can be tagged, but most can. And you can sort of, it, you can also make it inferences between, you know, of connections between things that are tagged and untagged. But once you've collected that view of an application, you can start to apply a risk profile and then use that to drive application of cloud native controls. In addition, we've also seen customers who sometimes use accounts or subscriptions or projects. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how people have organized that as a, as a layer in which they can then Sort of hone in on where where they need to apply controls. Yes, and where you actually you, you commented on it right there, and that is, is is treating the different environments separately, and and having segmentation between, um, e even if it's just non prod and prod. I mean, it, many many uh, folks will certainly have some kind of a development sandbox, but that that provides that freedom to innovate. But the organization should realize that as you progress further towards production, that you will have uh, less ability to to make change as an individual and that things should become really that that almost zero trust of that it's systematic or service accounts that are are managing those services you know, managing those resources and so to your point it's it's treating the individual areas differently and then utilizing uh, services and because really I mean at the end of the day it, it identity has become the new perimeter sure well, and let's, you know, as we think about this, let's, let's also just say, play, pay close attention to storage, database, cache, and search, because those things store data. And when we look at cloud service breaches, and this is again, because of misconfiguration, not because the, the service itself was, was insecure, uh, those things stand out, right? Um, when we look back in, in 2018 and 2019, Elasticsearch, S3, MongoDB, Right, Elasticash, these are the things that store data that people often forget about, like the search and cache stuff, that's been a real Achilles heel. People forget that, you know, they attach a database to it and they go, oh, that, that is PII, let me, get, let me get rid of that. And they forget, oh, it's just, it's stored now in this, this caching layer in the search. Uh, so don't, you know, certainly when you're thinking about where to apply cloud native capabilities, things like Macy, I'll, I'll harp on that again on the Amazon side, um, Th that really can help in, in some specific areas around around storage of data. Uh, be a view of the cloud native controls um, so across Amazon, Microsoft Azure, and GCP. Uh, so yeah. CloudTrail, you know, for example, there's audit logging, service catalogs, monitoring, uh, DDoS, um, uh, web app firewall, key management, optimization, threat detection, resource monitoring, vulnerability scanning, Deployment and secrets management. This is just a this is just a list of, of a smattering of services, and you know each cloud service provider, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, offer a a flavor of this. Yeah. And we, we want to put this up and ensure that people understand. You know, there's a lot of cloud security controls, and they exist across the portfolio of cloud service providers. And so, as an example, with audit logging, you have CloudTrail and Amazon Web Services. You have Monitor in Microsoft Azure. You have Cloud Audit Logs in GCP. Um, in the case of monitoring, you have CloudWatch for Amazon, Application Insights for Microsoft Azure, Cloud Monitoring for GCP. Um, for DDoS, you have Shield for Amazon, yep. DDoS Protection for Microsoft Azure, Cloud Armor for GCP. For Threat Detection, you have Guard Duty for Amazon, Advanced Threat Protection for Microsoft Azure, and Event Threat Detection in GCP. For uh, vulnerability scanning, you've got the inspector product from Amazon, security center from Azure, and the web security scanner from GCP. Um, 
or maybe you're looking at deployment and there you've got CloudFormation uh, templates from AWS, Resource Manager from Azure, Deployment Manager from GCP, and the list goes on and on. So part of the challenge, you know, part of what it, uh, with native controls is, again, it's understanding what controls exist. Yeah. If you're using multi-cloud, what controls are comparable across those clouds so you don't have gaps, and then when and where to apply those. And this goes back to what we've been talking about, which is a understanding what what framework do I want to use, you know, to help guide this, right? So NIST CSF with sort of the, again the different elements there. So audit, visibility, protection, and detection, and lining these different services up against that, and then mapping it across your cloud environments. It's also then deciding: Am I going to use that development versus production, or do I have, as you talked about, Thomas, this sliding scale that I apply additional additional layers of security as I move towards production? So maybe in sandbox, I have very little of this because no production data lives there. But by the time I get to production, or maybe even staging, I'm now layering in these elements. And it's right. going into saying, well, I have risk profiles. So if I know that PII is being stored in a particular application, I should treat that and apply things differently. Um, and the other element of that is, how do I ensure that all these things are being consistently applied against that process, right? So part of the challenge we're going to talk about now is, when do we augment, right? And how do we automate? Um, and so what are the what are the sort of gaps and weaknesses of the native cloud security provider uh, controls? Well, the first is that they are essential, right? That's not a weakness, but it's just it's just the truth. Use cloud service native controls like that. Th that is just hands down. You should be using it. The question becomes, we just talked about the effectiveness of this, um, you know, is is only as good as your use of them. And so it's. How, and, and one of the challenges, um, how do you know when to use them? And how do you then, once you've defined that, as we've talked about, how do you ensure that it's actually being done, right? And as environments get more complex, in other words, as you get more and more accounts within one service provider, like Amazon, or more subscriptions, as you get a portfolio of cloud service providers, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, in some cases, or more, Alibaba also, in some cases, as you run into these things, the ability to apply these uniformly and consistently starts to fall down on their own. Um, and I want to turn to you, Thomas, because the way that people often approach this at the first level is scripting. And I'm going to throw it over to you because I know you've had a long and sordid history with scripting, um, going back to your days in GE as a CIO there. You want to walk us through sort of how you started thinking about this and trying to apply native controls and just controls in general and, and where the limitations were there? Sure. Well, I, you know, and, and it is, it's, it goes back to some of those earlier GE days and, and G was a very early adopter of public cloud. And, you know, some of these, there were limited uh, internal cloud provider controls and, and security measures and they are they They truly are essential and they should be utilized, but especially as you start moving towards some level of automation, um, what I saw traditionally, and I continue to see this with other organizations today, is that the, the, the first thing to jump to is, okay, well, I've got this, this insight from, from a security the provider's tool. What do, I, what do I now do with that? Because they're, they're beginning to move into some of the areas of automation, but ultimately, a lot of them are notifications. And with that, you start out in, with scripting. And what I really ran into was at the time, nine individual businesses under this umbrella ultimately wanted to do it differently. So it was this mishmash of different tools, whether it was Ruby, Ruby on Rails, Python, PowerShell even, and the ability to try to not only manage that consistently, but to ensure that each of those controls that are scripted ended up remaining up to date just became truly unwieldy. And that was really at the time with only one provider. You started adding in multiple providers and it just, it truly falls down on itself. Well, and and I, I think to, add, to ask you some more on that point, I mean, part of the challenge I have to imagine, and part of this is as you've scaled, right, one of the things you, you really struggle, begin to struggle with is, um, is how to identify in an ephemeral world when to apply these, right? And that's why people go to scripting it's, it, and it becomes very difficult because, you know, maybe you build a script in one account Mm -hmm. We're in one subscription, but then all of a sudden someone spot because of self-service, someone spot up another account yeah. and another account. And on top of that, the number of services that they're using is changing constantly. And so you're having to maintain all that and you have to do that across multiple accounts. 
And, and then to some extent, it's how do I even know that that's being done? Right, because I, I need to be able to not, not only know that that the scripting is happening, but I, I have to have consistency. And, and what if someone disables one of these things? So yep. I've enabled CloudTrail, and someone turns it off. Yep. Or how do I know that the four developers who just who just got hired and spun up a new environment knew that they needed to go and grab a bunch of these scripts and that they had to apply Macy here and there? And so I think part of this is scripting is good, right? But it sounds like there's just this, you know, that it it it. The, as complexity increases, it becomes problematic, not only from a maintenance standpoint and creation standpoint, right? Which is, hey, I've got to go build stuff. And mm -hmm. that takes time and attention away from things I could otherwise be doing, right? right? But it's also just having visibility into whether or not I'm actually consistently applying it in the way that I've established this process. Yes. And that's, I think having a centralized platform to manage that automation truly becomes essential, especially in a multi-cloud world. Well, and so let's try and let's try and actually visualize this and talk about it for a little while. Because what what I think what we're talking about is is represented in this diagram, which, by the way, you, you can check out on our website. We have an uh, an article that dives deeply into this called "Augmenting Native Cloud Se uh, Service Provider Security." The URL is there as well, um, but you can go on and look at it and find it under our resources section. The risk is quite high as people adopt cloud in large part because they, they don't adopt cloud security provider controls, either because they don't know to use them or they haven't had the time to deploy them. Um, and for most folks, they will start using those controls. Um, and that starts to really bring risk below risk appetite. And that's the idea here, by the way, is that everybody has different risk appetite. So if you're sitting at home watching this, um, the answer to, or, or in your office, uh, the answer should be, uh, when do I apply native security controls? Well, it should be where you're, the risk you feel you're incurring in the cloud is greater than your risk appetite, right? I mean, fundamentally, that's when you want to start applying these because they are without cost, right? They do cost yeah. money often to deploy them, right? So there's a dollar cost to using Macy, the, the, my, my favorite service. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a cost of actually deploying it, as we've talked about, and deploying it properly and consistently at scale. And, and so there is this function of what is my risk profile? Um, and that may be different by application as we've talked about, or, or by, by business unit. But again, you want to establish that risk appetite. And if you are above it in your approximation, then you should be deploying the native controls to, to reduce your risk to below your risk appetite. Now, the challenge becomes that, as we've talked about, with increasing complexity, you eventually get to the point where that, that risk profile pops back up above risk appetite, simply using the security tools by themselves. And therefore, what we've described, and I think Thomas, you can touch on that again, let's just summarize, as complexity increases, it becomes harder and harder to actually consistently leverage these tools in the right place at the right time. Is, is that right? Is, why, why does this pop back up above, above risk appetite? Yeah, I, it's, I think it's a, a couple different factors. One, certainly the, addition, you know, the additional providers being introduced into the mix, and, and ultimately, most organizations of any size will ultimately have a multi-cloud environment. But or it's even also, a multi-account or multi-subscription, right? I mean, even well, if it's yeah, one I mean, provider, it's that complexity still grows. Yeah. Yeah, sure, the complexity grows massively, as well as just the introduction of the various different services um, in different areas, regions, cloud providers. It just it just adds this level of complexity that it becomes very hard to to manage alone at scale. Yeah. Well, talk a little about that. So, I mean, I think the dynamics of that are. You mentioned that you start consuming more services, even in a single cloud provider. You start consuming those services across multiple uh, accounts or subscriptions. You may start layer on additional cloud service providers, right? Inevitably, for, for most organizations, they want to give best in class service access to their developers. So, you know, that .NET developer wants to use Azure, you want to say, no, I'm sorry, go relearn 20 years of, of, of work and, and do it on Amazon instead. Um, you want to give them access, and those things yeah. end up driving companies. And, and security needs to be a enabler and amplifier of digitally savvy business units. They shouldn't be saying, well, no, you can only use one cloud service provider because that's the only one I can confidently secure. Right, that's, 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 the, that's the thing we just talked about in the beginning, which is yep. that's the, the antithesis. Ultimate rock and river, right? Yeah, exactly, right? And so what you end up doing is eventually your cloud, your risk profile in the cloud bumps back over your risk asset. And that, by the way, that inflection point, that C, that is where you start augmenting the native controls. And so let's talk about what that looks like next. And Divi Cloud, by the way, 
that is that's what we do. We augment native controls, um, and we apply a whole another layer of controls on top of it. And we'll talk a little about how that works. But fundamentally, this is what we we see with our customers, which is that somewhere hopefully before C, although not always, um, and in some cases at A, they're they're deploying us, right? So where do customers tend to buy buy Divi Cloud and, and leverage us? Well. For the folks who are really looking forward at, at A, at the point at which they are starting their cloud journey, they're, they're layering on native controls and augmenting those with something like Divi Cloud from day one. But for many people, that may not start until they may start with cloud native controls, and that's perfectly fine. But at some point, they realize we've got to, we're, we're starting to see the curve go back up and we're going to buy. And in some cases, it's after C, right? This inflection point has happened, and, and they suddenly wake up one morning and say, oh my gosh our risk appetite is being outstripped by, by just what we're approaching. Um, and that's when they layer Divi Cloud on. And so how do we augment and, 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 how do, and how can you augment cloud controls? Well, one is you can use something like Divi Cloud, which ships with controls out of the box and map back to the cloud, to the frameworks we talked about yeah. as, as a mechanism, right? Because one of the challenges we haven't talked about here, and I think it's worth layering on is, you know, if you are saying, I want to be governed by NIST CSF or 853, or ISO 27001, or the CIS benchmarks, or let's say the um, uh, PCI, DS, PCI DSS, or GDPR, or HIPAA, these cloud native controls don't map back to those. You, you, you got it. I was actually going to add that in, in, in the fact that some of them have started in that direction, but at this point in time, they are quite limited as to which of the compliance uh, frameworks and packages that they offer, as well as trying to be able to, to have some of those custom packs that are maybe more enterprise specific that go beyond some of those those more uh, broader compliance frameworks. That's exactly right. And so when you start looking at this risk security, CSP security alone, going over the risk appetite, it's often where people start saying, well, we've now got to rationalize and standardize our approach to cloud security, and we're going to use standards to do that. Or, or we're required by regulation or by legal constraints to, to do that. And so when that starts to happen, that's when you can see these, this risk, this risk of by CSP security alone start to bump up. And that's where something like Divi Cloud that comes with hundreds of policies. In fact, you know, hundreds just in some map to, to these things and allows you not only to, to apply those on top of the native controls, but also allows you to automate the delivery and of, of those. So for example, Cloud uh, Trail is a great example we talked about earlier. Well, you can have a policy that says we want everyone to leverage CloudTrail. Well, Divi Cloud can enforce that policy across every account, and we can across and we can do the same thing relative to Azure and GCP. So, hey, I want I want to use audit logging everywhere it can be used automatically, writ large. But I'm in multi-cloud. Well, with Divi Cloud, you have a single policy that says always turn on audit logging, and if it gets turned off, turn it back on. And that policy will apply against AWS CloudTrail. It will apply across Microsoft Azure Monitor and it will apply across GCP Cloud Audit Logs, right? So the idea is I can set a single policy in a single place and every account and subscription and project that is under management by something like Divi Cloud, that's centralized management. Now, not only are we detecting any time when that policy is not being uh, applied, but if it's been applied and then suddenly uh, it'll say an attacker gets access and the first thing to do is turn off odd logging, we'll detect that and turn it back on. And so this allows you now automate and orchestrate the use of this cloud service provider tool, the security tool, in a way that is sustainable um, okay. and enterprise grade. Um, and beyond that, that's true of lots of things. It may be, hey, where do I want to apply CloudWatch or where do I want to apply Macy or Inspector? Well, in an ephemeral world, you know, this is what we see people all the time saying like, oh, I want to use Inspector uh, to do my um, vulnerability scanning, but everything's ephemeral. And so I, how do I keep up with the like thousand changes a day? Well, and by the way, this is true also of leveraging things like a Rapid7 inside VM or a Tenable or a Qualys, right? How do I know where to apply agents or where to scan IPs in an ephemeral world? It's an incredibly complicated problem. And that manifests itself, whether you're using third-party security tools or the native ones. And again, something like Divi Cloud, because we see everything, we have visibility into everything, everything is created, modified, or deleted across all these cloud environments. We're able to detect that change and ensure that you're, you're able to scale and ad 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 adjust to that ephemeral world. Um, what, what other things do you think of when you think about how 
a third a system like a Divi Cloud, a cloud security posture management, cloud workload protection sort of com combination, cloud security platform sure. uh, can help solve for this it, 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 and, and where people should think about where they want to use it beyond what I've said. Well, I, I think one of the things, and it, it probably builds on part of what you said, Chris, and that is, is we talked earlier in the discussion about the fact that as part of this, the ability to audit. And I think one, one of the advantages that Divi Cloud does provide is, is having that centralized view where every single one of the resources are, are effectively brought in into a single data plane and treated equally, as you talked about, and how you can apply automation. But at the same time, it ensures from not only an internal audit perspective, but for those, for those who might be listening that have external auditors, the fact that you can, can certainly show that you're treating all of the resources equally and protecting them in a, in a similar way. You also talked about you know, the, the fact that you know, areas where things haven't been applied, you may in some cases even wanna think about that you don't want to apply in some of those, maybe those more uh, areas that, that provide some freedom in those development environments to ensure that you're controlling costs. So that's another way to look at it. But I think um, ultimately, um, what we really see, where we see a ton of folks gaining a ton of value is um, one, ensuring that things are on and are being uh, utilized, being able to ensure that they are through that automation and having that visibility. Well, and I, I do want to touch on something you said earlier, Thomas, as well, and, and maybe have, but it's also, I think that one of the things Divi Cloud provides, which the cloud native tools don't always help with or, or, or aren't quite there yet in terms of being able to apply security is pre-flight. Right, yeah. it's shifting yeah. back into DevOps. Can you touch on that a little bit as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think um, that's, a, that's an entirely uh, new realm, if you will, of thinking, not new in the sense, but we've always thought about this, this full life cycle. But with this ability to, to completely move over into the, into the CICD tool chain, it also drives an immense cultural shift. And, and we touched on at the beginning, but it's, it's really, it, to me, it's everything that the security team wants, right? Is that every single person in the organization is thinking about security in everything that they do, especially in the cloud. And by having only after, after deployment resolution, I would say sometimes that, that provides a feeling of that, that stick, if you will, that I've been penalized for something I've done. And boy, wouldn't it have been nice if I would have been told before my deployment that I was going to cause potential harm to the organization. And I think yeah. that ability to do a pre-scan, provide back uh, before the build is even complete, information to the developer that says, you have failed these four checks, um, and here's how you can resolve them, is just absolutely essential in building the right culture in the organization. Yeah, so to summarize, I think, you know, where, where customers start thinking about, again, applying a, a, a augmenting cloud data security tools is dependent on, on the customer, right? Sure. It may, may start at day one, some start, you know, at, you know after they've deployed the, the tooling, um, and, but before they've, they've sort of breached their risk appetite, and some, you know, some re realize it after the fact and then, and then, and then apply it. But, but nonetheless, there are you know, clear reasons why you augment them. One is most of this tooling exists at runtime, right? right? And we want to shift cloud security left into the CICD process, into DevOps. And that's what third-party tools like Daily Cloud can do. We can take these same policies, apply them before they're launched and kill uh, or fail builds uh, before the risk actually is created. So that's one thing which the, you know, th these tools just don't provide that, that level of area. Um, the second one is you want to have a unified compliance configuration management layer across a all of your accounts or subscriptions, but also across all your clouds. Um, and you want that in alignment with the standards and regular requir requirements you have. So things like PCA, IDSS, HIPAA, SOC 2, uh, CSA, CCM, um, all those. You want to simplify risk management through the use of controls and automation again, centralized that give you the ability to say visibility, assessment, prioritization, remediation, automation, and proof of all that, right? Yep. And you want to do that in a way that ensures consistency of the application of policy and the application of the cloud security tool, tool usage to, those, to, the, to your policies. Um, and then last but not least, you want an automation engine that cuts across all your accounts and across all your subscriptions, across all your clouds, because that single um, automation approach 
is, is sustainable, right? right. That you're, you know, going back to your, your scripting days of GE. And so I think that's where everyone looks at augmenting this. It's like, and, and it is augmentation, by the way. It is Absolutely. how do we use these in the right place at the right time consistently because they are not without cost. Um, and, and you want to use them wisely and smartly, but also how do we enforce their usage where we want them to use? Um, anything that I've, I've missed in sort of that, that quick summary of this? Of this no, uh, it, that is the exact, that's exactly where the team needs to be thinking. Well, let's, let's, uh, and, and let's end there in sort of a quick discussion maybe on automation, um, because I think this is an area where we really talk a lot about, we've talked a lot about automation, and I think it's worth highlighting. Mm -hmm. Automation to us means leveraging automation everywhere you can. Right, so to the extent that you can automate your DevOps, you should be looking at tools, uh, CI/CD pipeline tools like Jenkins or Travis CI or Circle CI, because the use of those tools and the use of that automation will allow you to then layer in things like the automated um, uh, cloud security checks that you can you can drive. Right, um, it can layer in. You should be leveraging things like infrastructure as code templates. Right, so using a product like Terraform from HashiCorp or CloudFormation. Uh, or uh, at, or a resource manager from from Microsoft um, or cloud deployment from from Google. These are all uh, the cloud native capabilities. We love Terraform because it's multi cloud, um, and so you know that that we think has an advantage. But obviously, you want the best of class. Um, so that's that's one layer. Can you talk a little about you know anything I missed there DevOps wise? You know what what's the advantage of, of using automation in that DevOps process, just writ large? Sure, I you know. I, I think it provides that ability, um, you, you touched on a little bit, is really consistency. And, and I think that's in all things, you know, automation ultimately drives consistency. And I think, um, you know, back to that advantage of the multi-cloud, it, it, you know, with Terraform, it does, it provides that ability to, I mean, that's just one example, but it provides that ability to almost think of the deployments more as these Lego bricks, right? That it, it it also gives that ability to, in some cases to try to, to pre-approve some of those templates. And there's, there's always some of those one-off areas, but by automating a lot of that upfront, it provides that accessible speed back to the development teams, which is, which is huge. And it's also catching things much earlier in the process. But I mean, to talk a little bit, I think more broadly about automation is to think of it though as a maturity curve. And it's, it's not necessarily starting at the end with this this full blown out but you, you got to start somewhere and, and you kind of you know listed some of these levels here and i think it's you know one in ensuring that visibility accountability through some of the logging areas um, and then beginning to apply some of the, ma the major best practices um, I, I guess chris I, I one question i have back to you is, is kind of as you look across some of the client portfolios where you know where do you see uh, folks in those maturity curves and how fast do they accelerate through them yeah, I, I, look, I, I, I think that all it just all depends, right? Yeah. I mean, every customer has a different process they go through. What I will say is that as you think about cloud adoption, it really is a broader adoption of agility, for example. Yeah. You know, so you, you think about this cultural and organizational shifts that we, we talked about. Can't, you know, and we've talked about this in the past, Thomas, about things like the, the cloud center of excellence being created. Yep. And people often think, oh, well, that's cool. The cloud center of excellence is going to help us adopt cloud. And that's true. But in my opinion, what I, or what I observe is that it really helps to drive organizational change and transform the organization to a more agile organization. Because ultimately, the customers that succeed in adopting cloud and frankly succeed in adopting cloud security are the ones that are embracing agility. Yeah. And that are, are moving from, you know, so that, and that's sort of a, that's a organizational wide shift. And the ones that are effective at doing that are the ones that move through the maturity phases the, more, most quickly. The ones that are unable to make those cultural and organizational shifts, by, which by the way are incredibly hard to make. Yeah. Um, those yeah. are the ones that a year or two later are still, you know, we'll be looking and saying, you know, I, and I, I, I'm just thinking about one in, off the top of my head where, you know, they came out and they made this big, you know, announcement saying, we're going to transform our business over the next three years. We're going to use cloud to do that, and you fast forward two years, and they barely they're barely even using cloud, yep. and that's not because of a desire to do it. It's because they have not been able to change the organization, yes. and and that's and that's that that and then of course, some of that is all wrapped in together. It's sort of the chicken and the egg, which is, can you change the organization 
if you can't build trust. And mm -hmm. so part of building trust is, can we believe, can we fully embrace self-service? And if, and the way we fully embrace self-service is by driving tooling to support that, right? So that we can move from command and control to trust but verify. And so there's a lot, a sticky point where a lot of companies just, they don't put the, the right investments in early enough yep. to actually then be able to say, okay, we, we feel like we can do this. We can prove that we can do this. And that's where I think automation comes in. It's, it's just, it's saying, hey, come in here, do all these things. And, and functionally, um, you know, that's where we come in because we think, you know, there's levels of automation. We have a, a, a paper written about it, the four levels of automated remediation on our website that I encourage you to check out. But it's often, we walk through how do you adopt automation in very agile sort of like lightweight steps yeah. to really break down the barriers. Because a lot of people find automation scary. And so we want to help you with that and say, hey, as part of this process, as you augment the cloud management tools and you think about automation, you don't have to sort of go all in. Don't boil the ocean. Yep. Take, take small agile steps in how you use it. And eventually you get to the point where you get to this automated remediation where you're actually changing things. And I want to, I want to go there and make a, sort of a final um, you know, thing to say, if you uh, enjoyed our conversation about things and are thinking, man, I really would love to, to learn more about Diddy Cloud. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you the quick 30 second pitch, which is that we protect cloud and container environments from misconfigurations, policy violations, threats and identity and access management challenges, both during DevOps, uh, through integration with the CICD pipeline and at runtime. And that's across Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Alibaba, and then Kubernetes, which we see as another infrastructure layer. And that's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, functions as a service, containers as a service, and again, things like identity and access management. We, we cover the full estate. And we really help customers, again, ensure that they have visibility, assessment of risk, prioritization of risk, remediation of that risk through automation, and the proof of all that. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, you know, there, uh, we have a website, divicloud.com slash native dash CSP. Uh, the, the three L, uh, articles and reports that I talked about here today are, are on there. Feel free to do that. And if you're interested in getting a free, a free 30 day trial, we offer that. Uh, you can go to divicloud.com slash free trial. Thanks and, and looking forward to some questions and answers now. Absolutely.